Well, it's great to be back in Saskatchewan, especially, uh, I don't know if a lot of people know, I actually go about 45 years ago, I was in Regina playing for the Kiwanis Blue Bombers, I think, a long time ago. It was about five years of minor hockey here, but brings back great memories. Uh, the other thing, and talking to Kinger about coming here and, you know, the, the heritage with Saskatchewan, but all that stuff aside, and I'm so glad that Kinger said, you know, we want you to talk about penalty killing because for the last three months, all I've talked about is lottery draft, trading people, politicians, owners, <laughs> where are we playing, where are you going, my wife's in, are we moving, should I sell the house, should we stay, should we go here? So <laughs> to get into some hockey tactics, this is going to be a good day for me right here. I mean, that's <laughs> simple as that. I mean, the coaching part of the game is, is really the fun part. And most of you guys here, are, I mean, every day you go to the rink, it's a passion for you. It's still a passion for NHL coaches also, but there is a lot of distractions. So, uh, like I say, today is a, uh, a tactical part, which is I'm looking forward to just jumping into. What I've done is I put together um, a penalty killing presentation that is it's not the uh, Arizona Coyotes uh, penalty kill. It's a, it's a combination of a lot of coaches throughout the league, just your basic structures that, uh, that you see. And a lot of you probably know these structure or have seen it or tried it, uh, but there's some little details. And when you come to conferences like this, I, I, I still enjoy going to them because there's some that, you know, you say, oh, I, you know, I've seen that, you know, heard that. Uh, but every time you go, you can grab one little detail or grab one little thing that you think might help your team. And uh, it's no different, like King are talking there, I guarantee you there's going to be 10 things that he just talked about that I'm going to revisit with my team going, going into next year's training camp. So just the details, the simple stuff, whether it's penalty kill and how you run your team or, or development, whatever it is, I, I can't tell you how important these things are just to help you grow as a coach. So with that, we'll, uh, we'll go into a little bit of penalty killing. This is a simple one here, and you hear this one a lot. It might not win you a game, but it can lose you a game. If you watch what happens in the NHL right now is uh, the power play was unbelievable, won us the game, right? So you win a game, but when you're penalty kill, we should have got the kill. If we get the kill, we win, right? So it can lose your games, and that's a mentality your team has to have. Like your, your penalty killer is a penalty killer is a big part of your game, and if you look at the history of playoffs, or just teams as it go through, but in playoffs, the last six Stanley Cup champions have been over 83-9, I think was the lowest penalty kill they had throughout a, a playoff series. And you go back to Chicago a couple years ago, it was 90.2. Remember, uh, Boston beat Vancouver. Boston power play was brutal. I think they were 9 or 10%, but they had Chara and Bergeron, and they shut the Sedins down. It was the biggest factor in, in Boston winning that cup against Vancouver, is your penalty killing allowed them to, to buy in, and it allowed them not to lose games, but keep them in the games. And it's not as heralded as a power play and everybody wants to score, but your penalty killing is a factor. If you're a good defending team and a good penalty killing team, you're gonna be a good team. All right, so it might not win you a game, uh, but it certainly can lose you a game. Coach's decisions. So you got every coach you go in and you're talking about your penalty kill. First of all, the personnel. There's always a great debate. Do you use your best players? Do you have role players? Well, every team is different. You have, you have teams that I really believe, and like King was talking about, teams have to, your, your players on your team all want to roll. They all want to grab something. They want to make sure that they have their part. And sometimes, you know, you got your third, fourth liners that are, uh, they dig into a penalty kill, might be a face-off guy. Those are, those are situations you've got to give those players the opportunity to succeed like that. But on the other hand, sometimes your best players, and just like what King was talking about, Habby, there's players that have not got the opportunity to penalty kill that are unbelievable penalty killers. And usually top players, they have skill and they're smart. They're smart. Penalty killing is a lot about anticipation. So the players you use uh, is, is a big factor in it. Your, your role players, they, they take ownership to it, but your best players can have an impact on your power play. There's times in a game also with, like if we get in, jump into a game, your top players are sitting there and typically they're not penalty killers. So you take two or three minors the first period. Well, your top players have been sitting on the bench the whole time. So if you're saying, well, I just got my penalties. Sorry, I can't use you. We're killing penalties all the time. That's where your top players, you can lose them for the rest of your game. So decisions in the game, who you're going to use is a big part of it. All right? Having a plan goes without saying. 
You have to have a simple structure of your, of your penalty kill, and this has nothing to do about the team you're playing against yet. Your penalty kill has, should have an identity, should have an identity. Are we going to be a more aggressive one? Are we going to be passive? And there's adjustments you make in between there, but your penalty kill, you've got to have a plan going in, and that goes right throughout your whole lineup. Simple, simple stuff we'll talk about, pressure versus contain, just the structure in which you're going to play, and this is all over the ice, whether it's four check or in zone. The preparation, how much do you practice it? How much do you have uh, video meetings? In the NHL, I mean, our practice time is so limited right now, with, especially if you're a team in the West with the travel schedules, that uh, we probably do more video and more chalk work uh, with our penalty kill than we actually do on ice. But there is times when our penalty kill go out and a lot of it's pattern stuff. The other part about uh, the practice part of it is we get in situations, it's hard to mimic a true power play because if you want your penalty killers to go out there and do the right thing, are they going to jump in front of the puck and, and block shots in practice? I mean, that's not what you want either. So uh, the practice and video thing, the one thing you've got to have is when your players go into a game, they you know, know you're prepared, whether you've either practiced it or the video is they know what they, ha what they have coming uh, going into the game. The pre-scouts, strengths, weaknesses of opposing power plays, that's uh, when, you're, when your penalty kill is really in sync. You can tell because you got, like we've got, uh, had a guy, Boyd Gordon, up in Edmonton now. This guy was, uh, he'd come in, he'd want to know about a couple critical centermen and a couple of plays that they would have, and he would just take it and run with it. Take it and run. And that would help us coaches. Like we would be in a situation where Boyd had already talked to three or four of our guys to read a situation. We brought it up on the film. These guys already know what we're talking about. So the, the strengths and weaknesses and having the, your players take ownership to the pre-scout is a big part of it. The last one is PK is used as momentum. And I don't know if anybody saw, there was a line by Jonathan Taves here a couple days ago uh, after the last game of the finals. He said, I think we have Tampa thinking about their power play, right? And what it is, it's given us, our penalty kill has given us momentum over Tampa's power play. And if you're gonna see that going into tonight's game. There's been talk for the last two or three days about Tampa's gotta make adjustments on the power play. Well. Taves, Chicago feels like they've got them, they're in their brain about, about their, their power play, which is part of, the, part of the equation. If your penalty kill can gain momentum in a game for you, it's a huge factor, huge factor. One of the, I, I played for Scotty Bowman one year in Pittsburgh, and it was, a, it was an interesting year, just a little side note from penalty kill, because that was a year I was chasing, trying to, trying to get on a team that won a Stanley Cup, and they'd won two Stanley Cups in a row, Unbelievable team, Lemieux, Stevens, Yager, Francis, uh, Joey Mullen, I mean, just full of Hall of Famers. Well, that was your, I remember, uh, Scotty Bowman had coached a year before, and they didn't have a coach going into training camp. And Scotty was there, but they weren't sure if they were going to let him coach. Craig Patrick was the, uh, was the general manager. And I remember signing there, I was playing for Washington, and I signed with Pittsburgh thinking, this is my chance to win the Cup. So I get, to the, I get to the training camp, and Scotty Bowen, we have no coach. We got three assistant coaches, and I just thought Scotty was going to come back and be the coach. He was a, just won the Stanley Cup. Well, I come to find out there's a collection of players who didn't like Scotty's practices. So we go into training camp. We have three assistant coaches. Scotty's not on the ice. And I'm a, you know, I'm a veteran player. I'm going, this is great. I get to play on a great team, learn from a great coach. This is, this is going to be good, right? So finally, I like, what's up with Scotty? He doesn't practice. He goes, no, we're still working on that. I said, okay, I said, looking forward to you know, Scotty Bowman. I want to see what this guy does. He's the greatest coach in the history of hockey, right? Comes around near the end of training camp. Finally, they say, okay, we come to a deal. We're going to let Scotty coach. And this Craig Patrick comes in and talks to the, the players. And we're going to let Scotty coach, but I've come to an agreement with Mario and some of the players. He can't practice. Right? So... So now here I am, I'm going, greatest coach in history of hockey. I'm thinking I'm going to learn a ton from this guy. Didn't practice one time. We won the President's Trophy that year. I remember one time we, we'd, uh, I think we lost a couple games in a row. And I remember walking into the rink and Scotty had a pair of skates with him. And Mario walked by and, no, no, no. <laughs> but, so long story short, I, I'm, I, this comes back to momentum. So... Scotty, one of the things that I learned from Scotty was momentum changes in a game was a huge, huge thing for him. And I'd never really seen it before, 
But during a game, he would sense when momentum would change, and not just on PK, but, but any time in the game. And he would always try to, if we lost it, he would do it, something to get it back. If we didn't have it, or if we needed it, you know, to start a period, he would find a way to get it. But that PK as a momentum thing, I mean, PK is one time, and if you think about it, your penalty killers can go out work their best players, right? That puts a team on its heels. Your penalty killers can go out and outwork their best players. And that, get, that, gives, you, that gives you an edge right there. All right, so don't underestimate the, the gain of momentum. All right, key elements to your penalty kill. And we can talk about X's and O's and do this and do that. This one right here. You can't have a good penalty kill without, <laughs> without good goaltending. It's just the way it is. It's the way it is. Four check to arriving in D zone coverage or D, arriving in D zone. This one used to be, I, mean, I remember 10 years ago when I first started and uh, Lammers in the, in the, was with me in Dallas. We all we talked about just the four check. I think it's progressed now. It's four check and it's arriving in the D zone. Because to arrive in the D zone, arriving in the D zone is a big factor of how you have, uh, are gonna have to get out of the zone. D zone structure, whether it's pressure or contain, and face offs. To me, those are the four key elements of your, of your penalty kill. If you're on top of all those, you're gonna have a chance to have a successful penalty kill. All right? First, let's go to the goaltender. Make sure your goaltender is involved in the structure. We have uh, Mike Smith is every penalty kill meeting, he's a big part of it. He's a big part of it. There's different things, and I've got a couple clips on here I'll show you, where the goaltender is actually in the structure of your penalty kill, whether it's a guy walking out, whether it's a guy, you have a defenseman in a shoot, certain shooting lane, where that defenseman knows he has to be in that lane. So if he's in that lane, the goaltender knows he can cheat to the other side. I mean, the goaltender has to know exactly what your, what your, uh, what your structure is, and he has to be a part of the, the equation and obviously you gotta make key saves. So if you look at here, here's some clips. So this is all penalty killing, and Montreal, they got good structure, but this is what happens. This is penalty killing. You know what, after the game, if Montreal goes six and zero on, on the PK, they had a great PK, right? Well, that headman just walked right through their whole team, right? Price doesn't make that save. Your penalty kill is not quite as good. Here's one here, Price again. One timer, three guys behind the Montreal guys, right? That's three guys, that's, and after the game you could walk out, penalty, uh, penalty killing was good. Price isn't there, it's not so good. Here's one, this is from the, uh, the Washington series, Washington Rangers series this year. It's interesting, like, Rangers were just lauded for their penalty killing. Like, they came out of it, their penalty killing was unbelievable. Watch this penalty kill. That would be Ovechkin. <laughs> right? Same game. That would be Ovechkin again. Another time in the series. Those are pretty good attempts by Ovechkin right there. Here's one with us. Hard play, a little redirect right in front. Smith, great save. Here's one, Crosby, right in. Here's one similar as, uh, as Price. Somehow Pittsburgh gets two guys behind ours. So your penalty kill can't all be about X's and O's. Your goaltender is your last line of defense. So don't let the goaltender off the hook. Don't let him off the hook. He's got to make saves if you're going to have a good penalty kill. All right? Four check to arriving in D zone. The pressure up the ice, I believe that chase can, can really help your group because it gets your group energized. It can spend less time in the D zone. You disrupt an, an opponent. And if you look at the NHL right now, everything is done. Uh, the breakouts are so, they're just so structured. Everybody practices it. If you can disrupt them a little bit, it's an advantage. It's an advantage. Anytime you can take 10 or 20 seconds off the clock, you can really, you can really uh, disrupt a team, and a chase will do that. Put the opposing PP on their heels, we talked about that. Take them out of structure. You get, especially when you go into a, a visiting building, if you can get the home power play where they're dysfunctional a little bit, you got fans uh, jeering at them a little bit. You get, uh, not top guys, but there's a lot of players, it's funny how they don't want the puck quite as much when the fans are 
booing when they touch it, right? So you can get them off their game. Here's a simple one with the Rangers here this year. So it's a defensive zone faceoff. You see they're just starting the penalty here, right? They win the faceoff. Obviously the Rangers have a plan. And the Rangers are good. They've got some good quick players. Columbus maybe thinks that they're going to come down and all of a sudden we're just going to lay off. Not only the two forwards are there, their D is right up on the play. So now we've gone from killing a penalty, two guys, now they get a quick change. By the time Columbus actually gets back there, they've got 20 seconds off the clock already. So having a plan to chase, whether it's off a of face-off or this one here, this is Calgary, you see that it's almost 50 seconds off. These guys here probably been out for that first 50 seconds. Star players like that. They don't, the, those 40 seconds just on the power play don't really count to them there. But if you look at 50 seconds in, now watch what happens. They block a shot. Dallas is changing. So now they go from, basically it's two on two. Dallas is on the power play. We're two on two down here. Kill a bunch of time. Now Dallas feels like they've got to come back to get the puck. Now we're into this almost a minute and 10 seconds. And even though Dallas' star players are really good, once you start getting by the minute and 10, there's not many coaches that are going, okay, yeah, just stay out for the, the other 50 seconds. So having, that, having the, uh, the ability to get down and take time off the clock is a big factor. All right? One, three, four in the wide lane. This was... Uh, uh, probably the most used one here for the last uh, up, to, up to three or four years ago. It's lane discipline, make sure you got gaps, awareness of stretch plays where you got to make sure there's a guy coming behind you. This, what this does, it forces chips and dumps with, uh, that uh, allows goaltenders to get involved, and you got to know your exit strategy. And basically what we can do, F1 can turn back in, force here, three guys back in the lane, or you can have an interchange. This one comes here. And this one has changed a little bit since the red line came back, uh, was taken out. Um, it's a situation where we used to be able to come up and you'd come in and you'd try to force that guy right before the red line. Now with the stretch play, you, you have a, a situation where we have to back up a little more. Here's a couple of examples of it. This is Tampa and they've got a, a forward and the forward can go in either lane. So they have their F1 come in here, he's going back. Here's their other forward. This is their other forward here. Pretty good gap right here. And what this is here, LA really doesn't have much room. They're going to end up dumping this puck in, which in a lot of ways is not bad for a PK unit. I like the way they come back. There are four guys around the puck. They always have a middle exit strategy. They come back. Middle exit is a big part of penalty kill right now. They come back. They get the puck. They're out. Here's one here. Montreal comes back at a guy. And the... Forward is in the wide lane. Again, real good gap. 1-3. This guy comes back, pushes in the middle here. This guy holds this gap. San Jose tries to chip it outside and, and it's broken up. So 1-3 uh, is, a, is a good, I mean, it's a, a, a good forecheck. Allows a lot of team, allows a lot of uh, uh, you to protect your blue line. The one way that, that you have to be aware of your F1 on those is once you... Uh, once teams start to figure out that's what you're doing, you see a lot of drop passes. So F1, you have to make sure that we'll talk about, you have a, a situation where he ha might have to re-attack re the drop player. All right? Having an excellent strategy, this is, uh, this is Nashville. And come back, forward in the wide lane. And this is a, we, I've played, I've had some goaltenders that really moved the puck well in Dallas, I had Turco. We always had a rule when they're dumped in, we'd try to push it and have it dumped in one way. And we'd always try to make it come back from where it, where it was coming from. So in here, this is Gostad comes down. This defenseman here knows that he's not going to let this get by him. What happens when you rim it around, the power play is going to have people coming to this wall all the time. We want it to come back exactly where it came from. And the second part of this, Nashville comes back. I'd rather see if this was a, we would have a player coming right back into this hole here. So you have a middle option or you can go right back out it comes back and then you got an option to exit there. So know your exit plan and on rims or off, off uh, situations where the puck gets stopped in there. All right. The I formation is one that's used a little more here right now. Two forwards in the middle and D outside lane. It looks a lot like, uh, it looks a lot like the 1-3 with a forward in the outside. 
the one key component here, component here is, uh, is the overlap at the blue line. And you'll see a couple of good clips of it here. So F1 stays in the middle. This guy comes back in the middle also. And your D, we like to have our D on dot lanes uh, so they can push out. Uh, nothing gets through the middle on us there. Here's a great example by Detroit. So you got both forwards in the middle here. These are two forwards. You got D and dot lanes here. Detroit is a team that they'll, you'll see, uh, this is Cronwell way out. When teams do stack up a guy here, Detroit will take a defenseman and shove him right out there. But it's basically a 1-3 here again. 1-3, and they really try to get up here. And what happens here is Cronwell jumps up here. These two guys become very important here because they're overlap. If this puck goes by, these guys are the guys responsible for it here. If it stops here, you come and, and help that out. But this overlap situation is a really critical part of this. You're, what you're happening is you want your forward there working hard to support the outside. And it happens here, they come, they stop it, and now it comes up on this side, same thing. So if this puck goes down to here, one of those guys has to go, to, this D comes back to the, to the front of the net, it stays here, and now you've got people surrounding the puck. I like the, what Detroit does. Again, they come back, have an exit plan, have a middle guy all the time, anything that gets down deep. All right. Here's one here, this is uh, LA, and LA does a real good job of this, really good job. So their second guy, he can pressure there. Their D backs off here a little bit, and this is a critical one. You see a lot of power plays come in right now, they have a bump back, and it's hard, it's hard to defend as penalty killers, but this is a great example of it. So you're into here, so they got the bump back, and uh, I think it's St. Louis here, it's too bad they're changing. So if you get in this situation right here, you're 1-3, you've deal dealt with the overlap, the D has taken the, the deep guy forward here. We would get in this situation where we don't want this puck coming back this way. So you get in a situation here where this guy, ideally he wants to drag it down, he's going to try to bump it back to a defenseman. This stick position right in here, the ability to get this thing and make it keep going forward is a critical element. Because if it goes forward, this guy's got him, you're in a confrontation, not an outnumbered confrontation. This guy here, if they try to pop it in the middle here, that's that guy's responsibility right there. You get right down in here. But this guy's responsibility is to keep this thing from going back. On this one here, they get lucky. That LA guy, we'd rather see that guy push that thing down in there where basically it's an outnumbered situation for your penalty kill, not your power play. Now, it ends up coming out of the zone, but that, that pull up, a lot of power plays, you'll see that a lot in games right now where it's a kick out guy and it's hard to defend. And the, the eye formation is a, good, uh, is a good one to nullify that overlap. LA again here, they do a good job. And this one here where Minnesota passes it early. So the second guy in the eye, he has the ability to attack, but when he attacks, this guy's got to come back in the middle here. Come right back in the middle and you take anything cross, it gets across, but that forwards, or the D's there, Kopitar goes, helps out, simple play. So that's the I formation, having the ability to attack, but that overlap when they do get in the D zone, or in the, in the offensive zone, is a big factor in that. The moving box is the other one, and this is uh, Jacques Lemaire is a big proponent of this back when he, uh, he did a lot in, when he got to Minnesota. It's play as four in the middle ice and continue right into the D zone. Uh, the key parts of this are swarm, outnumber, and make sure you have a middle exit plan. A lot of times on a moving box, it allows them semi-possession getting in the offensive zone, but what you do is you squeeze them off once they get into the offensive zone. All right, so these two guys can interchange or they can just pull up in their, in their lanes. Basically, this is what it ends up looking at. You give outside lanes, you take everything in the middle away, and you bring that box right back in. All right, here's one. This is uh, St. Louis. So Chicago's coming up the middle. Basically, here's their box. This D's up a little bit, but this is their box. They're not letting anything in the middle here. Anything that goes outside, now this whole box can shift and come this way. So everybody, you're not outnumbered situation. Everybody's right there. Chicago leaves the guy wide. If that, guy, that puck goes all the way there, that whole box moves. And we've got some better clips of it uh, later on. Here's Minnesota. There's their box in the middle of the ice. It goes outside, goes outside, which outside speed you're going to give possession here. Coming down. Now they confront it. Now watch what happens with this box here. The whole box moves out one right there. 
And basically, they've got three guys, they've got four. Your penalty kill has outnumbered the power play, and it's a simple clear. All right, so a moving box can be a real, real effective one, but you've got to, all the four guys have got to work in unison. Here's one, another one here. Again, it's outside. They pressure them. Watch what happens. It's a rim. The whole box goes together. Whole box goes together. They have a middle support guy. St. Louis wins some battles. The box moves, and it's up and out of the zone. All right, last one. This is uh, our team here. Coming down, we give up possession out there. Our whole box works together. Pittsburgh guy breaks his stick on this one, but our whole box collapses. And this is a critical guy for us. We always talk about, we want to swarm in here if we can outnumber here, but we always want to have this guy in the middle as a quick out. What happens is, in power plays, you think about it, every coach tells you, get around the puck, get around the puck, win the battles, outnumber. Well, they're going to have to put an extra defenseman in there if they're going to outnumber us here. Right? So have your, have your box go as one and always have a middle option out, which if you win battles, that guy becomes, a lot of times, that guy becomes an easy out and an easy clear for you. All right? Have a quick exit plan. We talked about the rim. Back where it came from is a big part of depending on how your goalie plays it. Net front support with, with Mike Smith. We try to force teams to, to dump the puck as much as we can. He gets so many pucks. But then the power play, think about what they're going to do. If you rim a puck, they're going down the walls. If Mike Smith gets it, we would rather have a guy right in between the hash marks in front of our net. Right? And everybody thinks, oh, you can't pass it there. There's nobody there. Teams go to the wall and take that away. There's nobody in the middle. So have a middle, a, a, a net front support guy. And the swarm, we talk about that middle support out. It's a, I can't tell you how critical it's become. The four check has become part of it. But arriving in the D zone and having a quick exit plan is a big part of having a good penalty kill. All right? Let's look at some defensive zone structure. We've got pressure points and contain. And in the, in the uh, defensive zone, these are off face-offs or, or uh, uh, when they get set up in there. Pressure points, the key for me here is one go, all four got to go. You lead with your stick. You don't, uh, we, talk, we don't finish a lot of checks on a penalty kill. You lead with your stick. Make sure you've got as much distance as you can. Read the play, anticipate where it's going. And if, if there's a key guy that is the first guy to go, the other guys, it's instinctive. They can read off where it's going. And the pressure, we can start from the top, the middle, or low. And there's, there's some, if it starts from the top, F1, you try to get things inside. When this guy gets inside out, that D knows that he can go, he can go, and this guy's coming here. So one go, four go. Here's a great example from Detroit. One go, second guy goes, this guy's ready to go, forward ready to go, and down the ice. All right, so one go, four go. On a, on a top press. Here's one a little bit different with uh, Pittsburgh against us. First guy go, doesn't get it locked in there. Go, go, go. And if that goes down there, he's going with them. Right? So it's a pressure. Pressure is a, is a key point of your penalty kill. You got it. Pressure takes time and space away, makes it much harder to make plays. Pressure can always start, also start from the half wall where you push down in here, that D's ready to jump on the next guy. If they have a guy down here, he's ready to go over your net front. So this is pressure from the middle, Bergeron and Chara, through the best in the game at it. You watch these two guys penalty kill together, it's, and this guy, I mean, talk about a long stick, that's long. Uh, but this, this guy here, it, it, you know, when you're coaching, I, I'm fortunate I get to watch a lot of these teams all the time. This guy, Bergeron, everybody, you know, in Team Canada's and stuff like that, he's never the heralded guy. You watch him play, he does so many things right in the game. It's incredible. And this is, this is just a simple example of him. So he reads that, he knows he's got Chara going there, he'll get this guy locked in. It's just a simple half wall pressure, right to there, right to there. Those two guys get guys in more trouble right there that, and kill penalties, and it's just a simple gone the other way. It's a half wall pressure of an anticipation. Your D and the forward are working together. The low pressure one is teams get in a situation where they uh, bobble the puck or something down here. These are two defensemen that are going to go. A lot of times they, they easy out. They say just put it behind the net. You might as well have your D go and your two forwards have got to collapse with it. So D1 starts the pressure here. Here's one with puck, bobbled puck, two Calgary defensemen. One there. A lot of times that's the automatic play goes there. This defenseman, there's no use giving him time to set up. Let's go. 
Let's go get in these battles. And it's a, we call it turn the wheel or whatever. But basically, it's a two on two. You win a battle and it's out. Here's a good example of Nashville coming down. And Nashville D, very aggressive. One there, one there. Their forwards down. D there, D there. Winnipeg's power play never gets a chance to set up. And they're outnumbered. There's your four again. So pressure can start from the bottom. There's no use given, unless you're a tired group, there's no use given a power play time to stand back and get set up and get moving. I'd rather pressure as much as we can. All right. The contain mode, here's some things that we talk about. It's be in shooting lanes, must take the middle blue line shot away. About uh, maybe four or five years ago, I did, a, I think it was during one of the lockout years, I did a study of uh, the top 10 power plays in the league. All 10 of them, I took every goal where it came from and marked it, whether it's uh, where, you know, the original shot originated from, and it was incredible. And we had this, you know, some kind of program that, that we had, had colored dots. It's incredible how many goals start from the middle of the blue line back there, whether it's a shot, whether it's a rebound off that shot, it was, it was astonishing. Like, you know, Joe Quinville and I played uh, together for a long time in Hartford. We always talk about taking the middle, middle point shot away. But when you start doing some studies because you've got too much time in your hands because the business of hockey, it's some of these things just jump out at you. And it's the middle point shot is the most dangerous shot you're going to give other than, you know, layup. But that's where a lot of the chances, a lot of the goals uh, come from. Stick positioning is key in a contain mode. High forward switch, you see a lot more of it in the game now. It's a way to contain a quick collapse to the net, no matter what, when the puck comes to the net. If you're in a contained situation, most of the time, you're going to, at times, give up avenues to the net. You see teams, you talk about just throwing the puck at the net. You've got to have the ability to, to collapse quick to the net. The net front D positioning, front post or back post, there's, uh, some of that is geared towards the, uh, the team you're playing against. But I'll show a couple of clips of this. That is, uh, there's, there's two ways of thinking of it, but it's, uh, it's, you know, I've been on teams or have been with coaches that have strong arguments for both ways. And the depth of the strong side D, uh, and that comes into play when you're in a contained mode. Basically, the depth of the strong side D means you don't want two D away from your net. If they're going to throw pucks at your net, you've got to have people at the net. So here's a couple of contained ones. This is our buddy Bergeron again. He comes up, he knows he can't get out to contain him here. He goes with him, contains him, contains him, comes there, and this is a switch underneath. This is a read that teams will make. If this guy gets by halfway, sometimes it'll be a situation where he can't get there. This guy has to stay in the lane, right? So you're taking, no matter what, you're taking a middle away here. Bergeron contains all the way, contains, down, ends up taking the puck away from there again. Here's a Boston doing the same thing. He can't get over. He wants to contain the middle shot. He doesn't have the momentum going with him. So the other, the bottom Boston guy goes. He looks, to me, this is a key part, stick positioning. Like right here, we would be telling our guys, try to take this middle play away. Now, if they go back all the way to here, now you can come up and try to start that press. But this is where you need to be right here. Stick in this lane. And I don't like where his stick position goes. If he keeps his stick here, we got a good chance of getting that thing stopped in the corner. Comes there. So Boston switches over. Now he comes all the way with him. Comes all the way with him. And this is probably Gully. Gully, you run the PP there? Where's Gully? Huh. Willie, who runs the PP for you guys? Gully. Gully, there you go. Gully's got a good one here. Push down. The key here, and again, we're trying to contain. We're trying to contain. This guy is trying to take that middle shot away. But it happens sometimes it gets made. I like where this guy is here, no matter what. So we get beat here, but that's middle lane. You've got to take that middle lane away if we can. That's Marchant is kind of taking the middle lane away, but could do a little better job. But you've got people back at the net. So the middle, middle shot taken away is a, is a big factor. Here's one here when... On the contain mode, so you're here, there's no force going on. I would like to see the Calgary player here keep going, and if you can keep the play going one way, you really dictate a side, and especially where you're coming from. So if he gets his stick in this lane, this guy stays in this lane, you're taking the middle away. What happens when, when you come back against the grain, 
these are when the switches start taking place and you get slow moving back into, into position. So this contain guy, if he gets a stick and top stops again from coming across here, that play goes there, he keeps going, this guy stays in the middle. When they get back, now we're in a situation where this guy thinks he's got to come up here and look what happens. We got one there, one there, and the backdoor guy, this guy is not getting back there. So if you can contain and your contain is pushing one way, try not to let him come back against the flow. That's a rule we always try to, to, to put into place. It allows the other three players on the ice to, to uh, read and react on what you're doing. All right. Here's a great one of where a stick shouldn't be. So this is the Nashville player here. He's got a stick inside. They really don't take anything away. Right there. He's got a stick inside. I would rather see this guy down in here. To me, to contain this, that right there is your most dangerous shot. If you back that up a little bit, if this guy comes, he's got a stick in the right, come up in here, come down in here. You got a contain right there. Don't do that, it goes to there. To me, that's the most dangerous play. If we can take that one away, that's what we're looking for. Now, there's a couple other ones here as we go along. Here's one, Anaheim gets in, they're in good contain mode. The ability to contain and then go. <coughs> contain, now you go. Go, 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 and puck is down the ice. Puck is down the ice. So contain is a, is a way to make sure you're in good position, but when you have a chance to go, you go. And this is one, uh, Willie will like this one. This is a clip that I pulled off. You watch Vancouver here and against a very good Chicago team who obviously has some people that can play with the puck. And, but watch, watch this group of four work, first of all, for about the first 10, 15 seconds. And then they get, once the power play gets uh, uh, set up, now their ability to contain and take shooting, shooting lanes away is excellent. So you watch the four guys work together. They work as four there. They're hard work together. They don't let Chicago off the hook at all. The four Vancouver guys working. Comes back the other way. Four guys working again. Surrounding, they've got their middle guy. Goes back to the other side. They go back there. Great contain mode right there. Still on them. And Chicago finally gets set up to there. So now, we're in contain. Let's, what, what options can we take away? They take away that, plays a two on one, net front, net front D right there. Take that away. Obviously your penalty killers get tired now, but I like what, they're in shooting lanes, they're not giving up anything. There's, they get one kind of attempt here <coughs> that Taves fans on, but other than that, shooting lane take away if he fans on that one. But from a hard work and uh, penalty kill, everything in lanes, everything in lanes, get nothing, sticks in lanes, right there, and a kill. Like to me, that's, that's an excellent job of penalty killing, of four guys working together and making sure the job gets done. Here's, uh, this is from the finals the other day, and I, I've been talking to Joel on the phone a little bit, just about uh, different scenarios. And Tampa's a team, they, They've got high skill, they want some plays down low, and either that or they, they're, and they don't want to take the middle shot. It's interesting, watch Chicago's penalty kill here. They have an eye, they'll leave the flanks here. Both D's stay tight to the net. There's no middle shot coming there. These D's stay tight down in here. They think Tampa is going to try, they've you know, got a history of lots of little plays around the net. They'll shoot from out there, but to me that's not a dangerous shot out there. The goalie can turn and play that. Chicago just stays right, this is contained at its finest right here. There's nothing there, that's, that's a pretty contained right there. Lots of this little stuff, when they try that little stuff, Chicago has as many players in there as they have. Here's the next. Next clip, watch Taves and Hosa are two of the best penalty killers in the league. Watch these two, they just stand here. Little switch off. I would say that's pretty much what they want to take away. 
And both D standing like both D aren't going to run around anywhere. They just want to be right tight. And this is why if, if uh, Chicago's penalty kill is a big factor in the finals right now, I actually think Tampa has probably outplayed Chicago, but their penalty kill, again, right back in that eye. The ability to have a plan, execute it, and know what you're doing out there is a big part of it. I talked about that net front and uh, uh, the, the net front D, back post or front post. And this is one uh, I've been to a lot of, a lot of coaches we talk about a lot. And this is one where your goaltender's got to get, got to get involved. On this one here, your D, we're talking about as a back post guy. And that one clip we showed with Ovechkin, that's a scenario where the back post, your D on the back post. And here's, here's a good example. So you've got, we're talking about this defenseman right here. This defenseman. So the depth of this guy is critical. To me, he's just a shade high. This back guy, this back guy becomes your net front D's responsibility. And it, it goes against to what uh, the old days, we used to always have that forward come down there, and I've got a clip of that. But with teams drop one guy in the middle here, this forward, it's easier for him to flex, or come down on him. This D takes the backside guy. This guy plays the two-on-one. But really, it's not a two-on-one. Your goaltender helps out on this one here. And this is, uh, I worked a couple years ago in the World Championship with uh, Pete DeBoer from, uh, was coaching in Jersey at the time. Marty Brodeur, this is a big factor for him. He wants, he wants that guy right there. He wants that. He wants to even the penalty kill up. He wants that player right there. He thinks that's his guy. Any walk out there is his guy. So we got that guy taken care of. He doesn't want anything coming across. He wants that guy taken care of. This guy is going to put pressure from back here or have, and the goaltender takes that. Just like what happens here, goaltender cuts that off. D has this guy, forward has that guy, D coming right back down here. All right, so the goaltender can be part of your execution there. Now here's the other way. So you got a D, and we usually play the dots here. This guy can take either of those. If he goes there, he goes there, and the forward comes down. And what happens is you get caught on this back, the, this guy in here, or you got a back door guy, right? And it's, uh, there's a lot of moving parts in this one. All right, so here's the Islanders. They're set up. This is a D. This is their net front D, net front D here. So he doesn't want this guy to be a factor in the play. Their forward takes the back door guy all the time. So it's just another way to do it. This was really, with Kinger, 15 years ago, this is the only way we did it. Where's Kinger? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a rotation from the forward. This one here, he goes, this D rotates back around. The Islanders do a pretty good job of it. But if you see power plays right now, that backdoor guy, especially when you have situations with Ovechkin and that coming in, we've found that our D, net front D, has a better opportunity to stay in front of the net than take himself out of the play. And your goaltender becomes part of your, part of your equation on any short stuff. But the depth of this, the depth of that D right there is imperative because if he gets too far away from the net, you can't, you can't rely on your goaltender to have, uh, to take up that much or to get that much space if he's got too much room to walk. So it's just, it's little things about penalty killing. That detail is something that seems like the last three or four years has really become prevalent. All right. Face-offs goes without saying, and especially in the rules now where you're starting your own end, have a, have a plan, communication, whether it's D flipped, uh, just know your exit plan, 200 foot clears, the worst thing is to win and draw and not get it down the ice. We always talk about three one-on-one -on -one battles. Three one-on-one -on -one battles and read the face-off uh, loss options. If a team's set up for a one-timer, uh, there's different setups that a team will, will try to uh, work on a power play. So simple ones, we talk about three one-on-one -on -one battles. This one here, Pittsburgh's set up where Latang is back here. It's three one-on-one -on -one battles. They think Latang is the best guy with the puck, so they flip their D over. Scuderi uh, here, he's going to get in the battle there. It's just a simple win. Three one-on-ones, Latang down the ice. Here's one. Detroit is one of the best in the league face-off wise. That it's just automatic. It's three one-on-one -on -one battles. It's not even close. Three one-on-one -on -one battles, and it's down the ice. Last one here. Anaheim has their guy flipped over. Three one-on-one -on -one battles, and you can tell that these players have all been that 200-foot clear thing comes in because it's repeated over and over again. There's none of that soft shit going down. It's, you get it down the ice. Right? 
Here's one with us, and read this. There's times when teams have a, uh, teams have a D up tight here. You can go out the other side also, but you've got to get lots on it. And this is the last one. Just there are options where you drop a forward low, drop a forward low, and these are things where the communication part is a big part of it, where it's touched to a forward. And a lot of times you can take away that D's reading the, the rim, touch to a forward, and it's out. Have a plan also when, you're, when you uh, lose a draw. This is Pavelski here, real good penalty killer. It's, San Jose is a hard pressure team out. Even though you lose a draw, you're right on the pressure and you turn the puck over. Here's another great example of, it's, we talked about pressure when it goes down the ice or pressure off a lost face off. This is the Islanders, pressure, 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 right on it, off a, off a lost draw. San Jose's got nothing and it's down the ice. So make sure you have a plan and if, you're, if your plan is to pressure off it, make sure it's one go, four go. All right, we'll just finish off last with a little bit of five on three and four on three. I know it's not talked about a ton, but there is a couple different scenarios that in the NHL teams look at. One high and two D low or two high and one low. All right, the one high and two low, a lot of this is geared around Teams don't want to give up anything, a backdoor easy play. They want any shots coming from out. They want to make sure they have two defensemen at the net all the time. And it can get in a situation where this F1 out here, he's taken away hard across one-timers. If you've got a player that, uh, i got one clip here of uh, uh, Bafuglu in there. He's got a cannon. You give that to him, it's, the chances of scoring are pretty good. So that's a, that's a scenario where it's almost a triangle with one guy up top. Here's a couple of... Uh, looks at this again Bergeron Boston plays this their Boston D are big strong guys that's the setup they're looking for they don't run D out uh, on either side they want 2D back of the net Bergeron handles everything up here and you'll see he just in the middle he's taking away anything coming across here 2D down on the three guys Bergeron comes down takes any lane so it's basically it's just a simple triangle force them into mistakes Takes the cross ice away again. The triangle in the middle does a good job. Here's one with us here. This is the one with Big Buff. We had scouted Winnipeg on this one here and we knew Winnipeg, this is the shot they're looking for. We just take our guy and put him up in here. It forces them into uncomfortable situations. They go there and we get out of it. So that's one way to play it. The other way is have a D that rotates up and down. You're forward. There's a rotation, rotation around. There's a lot of teams in the league that still do it this way here. Here's Chicago. They've got a forward on this side. This D will flex out a little bit. And it's just a simple rotation all the time. Goes across, that D flexes out. This guy stays tight. The one thing Chicago does, they are tight. Like they're not giving up anything down here and they're tight down here. Forward comes out. A little movement, forward still in the lane there. Give up a pretty good one. Here's Detroit. Detroit actually does a good job of it. So this is Datsuk, their D here, one D in front. It goes down, D slides down here to protect the back door. When it goes out here, comes across, that D goes there. Now this D's sliding in front. Anything coming across, he's, a, he's got that lane coming across there. With five on three or four on three, no matter what, you see you need a quick collapse to the net. Anything of these, you see pucks go to the net. More goals are scored off rebounds and direct shots right now. Here's another one where the D comes out. D right down in that lane right there. Right down, forward down the other side. That's five on three. A couple four on threes versus a, a, an umbrella. Most teams in the league, you'll see a play like this. Just a simple triangle. One guy facing up that, that guy faces up that shot, that guy faces up that shot. The one thing we talk about is you gotta be in the lane, and this is where uh, work with your goaltender a little bit. Sometimes you'll, you'll shade us one side or the other, but make sure when that puck comes through there, we got people coming back to the net, coming back to the net. Really, there's no shooting lanes. If he's gonna come there, you got a guy in shooting lane, which is, they got one guy, they got three guys right there, all right? <coughs> Last one, if there's some movement on a four and three, what you see, Steen is a real good penalty killer. Reading the play, sticks in lanes. 
He's got a head in the swivel, sees what's going on, out. Guy's not coming in on a one-timer here. Stick in that lane, stick there. So just some simple stuff, four on three, that uh, uh, you don't see a ton of it anymore, but it can, again, if you don't kill a penalty, you can lose a game from it. The last I'm just going to close, I spent a lot of time, especially early in my coaching career, talking to a lot of different coaches around, and I coached uh, the minor leagues down in Houston. I got to be uh, friends with a guy named Bum Phillips, who's an old, uh, old football coach, retired now. He was an interesting guy, and uh, uh, I used to talk, he, would, he coached in a, it was a very racially motivated time when he had his football team during the week. They were half black, half white players. He spent all week trying to just make them get along. And for some reason, this guy could make them come together on Sunday afternoon and turn them into a team. And so I ended up spending a lot of time with this guy. I remember the last time I talked to him, he's a rancher down in Texas now. And we were just talking. I said, Bum, like when you bring all your guys together, you know, you got guys that hate each other. They come on. I said, what'd you say to these guys like before they go? Because you went on the field. It's just like everybody's just like, all right, let's go. It's like a flip switch, right? And he said, son, you know what I told him? I said, everybody get a man, good guys get two. Let's go, right? I, everybody get a man, good guys get two. And since then, and Lamar will tell you, I have used that line in penalty killing at, all the time. Like, big kill guys, we're down a guy, everybody get a man, good guys get two. And guys will, yeah, hey, okay, let's go, let's go. So that's a line that, uh, you know, there's certain catchphrases in coaching, we use them all the time. Kinger uses them. But that's a line that I've used on my penalty kill on a ton. Everybody get a man, good guys get two. So hopefully that's a little bit of insight into some penalty killing in the NHL. I'm sure it's going to, uh, everything continues to evolve. The biggest change I've seen is more structure and the detail in which the structure is done is continues to involve, uh, evolve. And you know what that comes from? It's from guys like you coming to things like this that Everybody gets smarter. Everybody gets smarter, not just in the details, but how to implement the details. So I'll leave it at that. Any questions? Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. We've got a thing this afternoon, I think, that uh, we can get into. If you want to talk about politics or hockey, we can talk about that later today. But thanks very much. <laughs>